your crash in 1972 at MIS. Do you remember it like it was yesterday? Yeah. Were, were you uh-huh. awake through the whole dang thing? Yeah. Everything. I mean, you know, I, your car, you crashed off turn two, was it, at MIS? Yeah. Your car's on fire. You know you need to get out. And you are in the process trying to get out because when you're in fire you tend to go in panic mode i've never been on fire like that but but you want out of the car i know this and and then there comes a point when you're trying to get out of the car and you realize your arm is missing yes no you tell me it yeah well this is there's an underlying story here just like we have to start at the beginning grant king mclaren was uh was came in in seventy one and they had such a good car that that Grant King tried to copy it only he added four inches of wheelbase in it. So, so it was he, four inches longer wheelbase yeah, wise. Yeah, all in back of the engine. Really. Yeah. Well, every the cars kept going longer, longer, longer. Okay. So he built a couple of them, and the first race was at Trenton, like they always do. Mm-hmm. And he's got Steve Krisloff as the number one driver, and, and George Snyder is driving the other car, the car that Ziggy. I eventually got hurt in. So, and, and Grant, you know, he was a magical man. He, he, I mean, he really could do like nobody else. But he, he didn't have a lot of money, so if he could cut a corner here or there, he did. So when he put the car together, he had a windshield that was oh too thin. So when Snyder was out practicing the first time, the windshield's doing this, it's going and mm-hmm. it, it's shuddering and shaking like this. So George, and start driving George crazy, so George comes in and they take a little piece of aluminum angle iron and they bolt it to the side of the windshield to keep it from f- flopping and it worked perfect. Hang on. I really understand how this all, is, how this all, everything falls into place. The book. That's the latest. What I'm That's saying, really a cool book. I, and I really thank you for sending that to me. It's a man's book. It's good. It's all pictures. <laughs> uh, it's, pictures it, worth a thousand words. Oh my God. It's, it's, it's fascinating. I love it. There's stories in the front of it. By the way, and this, you know why I got this picture? A guy sent it to me for an autograph. I, I didn't have Your any, crash picture? No, the, the aluminum angle iron. Oh, I got gotcha. you. So, you did a nice job putting that aluminum angle iron on the, on the windshield, right? Yeah. Okay. Now, the other thing look at, see this button here? Yeah. That's, that was the f- second year of the full-face helmets, and that's all you had there was a, a button, and you'd pop the shield over it, and it was an elongated hole, and it would slide over that. So you got this and you got that, okay? Mm-hmm. So they, they practice at Trenton, and I don't know if the rear end broke or what broke, but they didn't, they didn't qualify, they didn't race the car. Mm-hmm. So it practiced. It had 20 gallons of, you know, you run about 20, 25 gallons of fuel when you're practicing and you don't carry any extra weight. So they go to the Speedway. They get the ride. Gary paid $5,000 for me to drive the car at the Speedway. Really? Yeah. Your brother Gary. Yes. Chunkered down five thousand dollars for you. Yeah. That's yeah. really cool. Right. A lot of money in seventy two. Yes, it was. I had just won the midget race at Phoenix and Manzanita and his midget and he was pretty high on me, you know. In nineteen seventy two we go, we run the Astrodome. This was the mm-hmm. third or fourth year. So I'm driving for Howard Lehman out of Springfield, Illinois. Gary's driving uh, his own monocoque midget. He built a midget with, with aluminum and didn't have a frame in it. It's, it's pretty famous. So Gary just uh, laps the field at, at uh, the Astrodome. Is that the one that A.J. Foyt was in? Yeah, and Gary yeah. lapped him. You ran yeah. second and Gary lapped him. So How, Howard Lehman didn't want to go to Manzanita. Manzanita every year was the first big outdoor midget race. We'd have the California guys come and the the racers from the Midwest would go out, and then it would usually be 45, 50 cars there. Well, this is Gary's first race with Roger Penske. First weekend, mm-hmm. champ car. Howard Lehman doesn't want to go to 
because he had a, a glass uh, specialty business. So Gary says, you drive my car. Now, now here's a kid brother. His brother just laps the field and, <laughs> and Floyd at, at the Astrodome. And here's his dummy brother. Well, I'll drive it, Gary. I'm sure it's good. I'm sure it's going to make me look good, you know. <laughs> so against all the world, Howard Lehman, Howard Lenny had four cars there. I mean, it was just star-studded field. So we go out to, to Manzanita. Now, Gary, that's the official first race of the year. Gary wins. Make a long story short, I qualified six, started outside second row or something. And no one was in the same zip code as me that night. I... Jimmy Crother was finished second, and he was like a half a lap behind me. So I win the race. Now, in the meantime, Gary runs Phoenix and, and finishes second or third, his first race for Penske. So it was a pretty good weekend. They, they wrote a story, or, or somebody said, gee, is anybody going to win a race this year other than Bettenhausen? Gary wins <laughs> at the Astrodome, and I get in the car and win at, at Manzanita. And Manzanita was... Manzanita was the west coast at Eldora. If you, yeah, you big would, old half mile dirt. Yeah, if you yeah. go fast there, you can go fast anywhere. Right. So we're, we're driving through Rolla, Missouri, or thereabouts, towing the car back, and I'm driving, and I'm, and you know, I mean, to win that race, driving your brother's car, that was probably our best, our best win together. And I'm driving along, and I'm daydreaming and living, because you live the race, so when you win. You oh, yeah, over. you keep playing it over in your mind, over yeah. and over. So I'm driving, and Gary says, uh, when I get to Speedway, I'm going to see if I can get you a ride. <laughs> wow. And, that's, and now here I am, I'm floating in heaven. I won a midget race against the world's greatest in my brother's car, and now my brother tells me he's going to get me a ride. And I never asked him, so he said, I'll see if I can get you a ride at Speedway. So he comes back and paid grand $5,000, and that's so I got the ride. So, now we're at the Speedway. The story only makes more sense when you backtrack it and put all the pieces in, don't, don't you agree? Absolutely. Wait, wait, wait till this other stuff comes out. The, the so, legwork is very important on yeah, this. Yeah. Uh, so, run the Speedway, do the, do the rookie test. Everything's fine, and Gary's, you know, talking to me and helping me, and, uh, and he says, Wally Muskowski is my mechanic. Mm -hmm. And you know who else is? Jackie Howerton. Those are my two mechanics. So we we do the rookie test, and and it's pushing. And I'm running, I mean, make the shows like 180, 182, and I'm running 170, 76, 77, and it's got pushing it. Mm -hmm. So Gary told Wally, don't touch the car unless I'm here. That's when you could practice at nine o'clock in the morning. Now this is seventy-two. This is Gary's first year to speed it with Penske too, so they're you know lightning fast. So he's mm -hmm. got his own deal, and he's trying to help me. We got there, and I don't know what day it was, but it was after I, a couple of days after I practiced my rookie test. And Grant, uh, short on short on motors, so we can't get get a lot of extra practice practice in. Try to get as much value out of as not as we can. And I came in one morning about 10 o'clock or whatever, and, and Wally said, what's going on? I said, it's got a bad push, Wally. Reaches in his back pocket, gets a crescent wrench out. And if you remember in 1972, they had wings that were almost like 747s. I, I, I remember well, yes. And Wally says, I'll fix that. So he goes up there and he loosens the bolt on this side. He loosens the bolt on this side and he taps the wing with his fist. Reaches over, tightens the nut up. Now, could you see that happening today? <laughs> no, but... <laughs> 14 gauges out there. So anyway, so I get in the car, I go one, two, three, and I spun coming off four. First lap. Hit the wall. So we went back to shop and we fixed it. We got it back out in the track. And I start practicing and we're getting close to... And Gary drove the car and he got it right at 179, 180. But uh, 
I didn't, uh, I didn't crash again. Everything was fine, but I didn't make the race. So Grant still owes, you know, he, he paid him five grand. So he owes me a race. So we go to Pocono. And if you remember 1972 at Pocono, they had the floods, the Wilkes-Barre, the airports were closed. Well, we went out there and we practiced for three or four days. I was uh, 16th or 17th fastest, really loved the place. And we go to draw for it's qualifying. It's a neat track. Oh, yeah, I love it. Qualifying at 6 o'clock on Friday night, and USAC says, well, we've got to cancel the race. The, the airports are all closed. Well, they let us practice for three days, you know, trying to kill ourselves, and then say that it's canceled, so they canceled the race. So I still haven't got my race in. So we go back to Indy. So Grant says, let's, you can run, we'll run Michigan. So we go to Michigan. That was when they had the twin 200s, correct? Remember? Uh, I do. Race. So we go there. And and I'm feeling comfortable. Everything is good, and uh, and I qualified. Uh, I think it was they had 26 cars in the field. I think I qualified 18. Mm -hmm. Finally, felt we went to wind shooters that night, and I just was so relaxed and felt so good, and everything. So we go out the racetrack Sunday morning, and and I'm starting 18th, and Grant is up about the fourth or fifth row where Chris Love qualified. And uh, I'm 178 mile an hour, I think it what it was. So the Valvoline truck, it sounds like a long drawn out story, but it's all gonna make sense here in a second. Valvoline truck comes down through there and fills all the cars up. Now this is back in the day when we had 35 gallons of fuel on each side, two separate tanks. Had a crossover tube that was about this big, so when the fuel tanks drained, they would go down equally. You understand? Mm -hmm. So we fill it up with race morning and and I got Wally and, and Jackie there and and I get in the car and I'm looking at so what's so well, let's backtrack that car. It practiced at Pocono, it practiced at Speedway. I mean it practiced at Trenton, practiced at Speedway, twenty twenty five gallons of fuel. And we went to Pocono, we practiced, 20, 25 gallons of fuel in it. We practiced, we qualified at Michigan, 20, 25 gallons of fuel in it. We top it off for the race. We put 70 gallons in it. So you know, when they said, gentlemen, start your engines, and I got in the car, all the shocks were bottomed out. You had not driven it yet with a full load. The car had never had a full load in it. <sighs> Which changes the handle and the characteristics of yeah. the car completely. Yeah, if the shocks are on them out, it does Oh, uh, like driving a go-kart. <laughs> so, then the cars are pulling away, and Jackie's got the front end jacked up, and he's spinning the, the coil over his uh, I don't know what they did in the back. Oh, my probably, God. Right? So, the race starts, and it, and between the wind coming off those big wings, and my head's going, and I just got... And I, I dropped back from 18th to, I think it was 21st or 22nd. And I just got, coming off two, I got a, this much high, and the car hits the, the wall with the right front. Not hard, but you don't have to. Armco guardrail, not concrete. I get it. So what it does is it breaks the tire off, the suspension, comes back and, get, you know what's there? 35 gallons of fuel. It <sighs> ruptures the fuel tank. Yeah. The fuel tank uh, and the car catches on fire. Now, here's what gets tricky. I'm in the car and when it hits the wall, my head goes over. You know that plastic button I was showing you on the, on the flip shield? Yes. That plastic button hits that aluminum angle iron on the windshield. And you know what it does? It shears that button off. So you lose your windshield. So the or your your visor. So the visor comes off. Oh. So here I'm running about 170 mile an hour. Car goes up in a ball of fire, in my face. And my mind tells me, I don't know where I'm going, but I don't want to be here. So I undid <laughs> my seatbelt, 
and you can't get out of those unless you push your arm, get your arms outside and push yourself up out of, like out of a bathtub. So I do this and I get my arm and I start to push myself up and the car veers back and being it's the aluminum side of the race car against the steel guardrail, it's going <laughs> and I got my arm caught in that. And it broke the bone and it cut my arm off. So it was laying on the racetrack. So I fell back down in the fire and and I'm trying to get and I'm doing this and I'm covering my face up. You can see my, my left arm is burned, tops of my legs are burned. And and right here you can see where the shield came off my helmet, right? All this was skin grafted and then my nose fell off. And I'm back in the fire and I'm, I'm and I'm trying and I'm trying and I, and I, I do this and the fire was so, well, it went half the length of the back stretch. It just kept bouncing off Ugh. the wall on fire and it came to a stop and the wheels were on the left side. Not, there's not a scratch on the left side, but everything is gone, right? The fuel tank is gone and it's right down to the aluminum seat that I'm sitting in and I'm next to the wall and that crossover tube is draining the 35 gallons out of the left tank mm. down between the race car and the wall. Ugh. And so, and they're shooting powder on it from all different angles, but not anywhere near where the fire is. Mm. So I go, I thought, what in the world, and the world wasn't the word I thought when I was thinking about <laughs> Is wrong with my my right arm, and you didn't realize it was missing. I, the fire was so great, I didn't know it, uh, my arm was gone. And I could, and finally I thought, why can't I get out of this? What the hell is wrong with my right arm? And so, plus there's now there's powder. I can't breathe the ox because it takes all the oxygen out there. So I just kind of did this, and I turned and I looked down, and I could see the end of my arm, where well, there was no arm. And then when I saw that, now they say this, I had a new called Whetstone Research Glove. It was supposed to stand a minute and 20 seconds in the fire and it burned the top of my hand. And so it had to be in, I was like a minute and 20 seconds I'm in the fire. But when I saw my arm gone, then I, I yelled out, you know, help me, help me. And so they came in and grabbed me and, and Pulled me out of the car. And uh, the the moment then you come to realize your arm is gone. I yeah, mean, I mean that was pretty I, I severe. I can't I can't imagine what that feels like. Yeah, I mean, so. How there's very seldom something happens to, to create something. A sequence of events go back that they never had a fuel tank. The tank was never f full at Trenton. They put that sheet that aluminum iron on the on the windshield uh, and then never filled the tank up again and then the plastic button now do you see what they got in the helmets now? yeah 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 well <laughs> racing is so much safer Steel now snap rings yeah and, uh, racing is yeah. so much safer yeah, now but, i mean but, it, it, it anyway, is you're so, safer in the daytona 500 than you are driving down i-65 absolutely but uh but anyways and so i stayed conscious through it we went uh they took me to the infield hospital and, uh, but you didn't even know your arm was gone. Don't no, you at feel that, at that moment I when did. you d then realize it's gone, and now your brain, your mind actually knows it's gone? Does is it at that point that the enormous pain? That or, I mean, I don't know. It's called shock. Okay. Shock, yeah. And uh, um, my favorite saying is, "I'm the luckiest man alive." And uh, people, uh, when I was doing my. Uh, prostate treatments, they said, well, that just sounds kind of, you know, you get burned, you lost your arm, how, uh, why do you say, <laughs> how can you be the luckiest man <laughs> You sound like said, the unluckiest. Well, I was but... told later on that probably, had I been there all by myself, my eyes would have dissolved in about another minute, and I probably would have died in about two or three minutes of loss of blood. Mm -hmm. So I say, 
Well, God didn't want me yet, so he wanted to give me a wake-up call, but he didn't want he didn't want me to come yet and, and visit him. And so when I think of what I've done since 1972, beautiful family, I have kids, you know, everything in my life and my health, I am the luckiest man alive because I could have been a memory from 1972. Absolutely, yeah. but I mean, I look, I look back over your life, and you know, losing your father. Um, I know Gary is gone now. Um, you lost your younger brother Tony uh, Jr. In, in the year two thousand in a plane right. crash yeah. in the winter of two thousand. And it wasn't just Tony. Uh, Jim McElreath lost his daughter Shirley, right. uh, Tony Jr.'s wife. Uh, the, your accident. You you've been through all this. Well, now I get prostate cancer. And, <laughs> but you're, I mean, you are the uh, uh, the shining example of of carrying the right attitude and it, that it does matter, the right mindset. And and uh, I mean, I, I just you are inspiring to me. And this I got to tell you, this has been, I've done a lot of interviews over my time. I've been involved in racing all my life and worked you know, ARCA PR director, 22 years and a lot more in and around that. But this has been, I'm going to tell you, I've interviewed, uh, interviewed some fascinating people. This has been the greatest interview of my time of my life. I've enjoyed this more than any other. Well, thank and, you. And I, I just so appreciate it. And, and, you know, um, I, I know the, we, we talked about the Borg Warner trophy. I mean, I, there is no family in the history of the Indianapolis Motor Speedway since it began in 1911, no family gave more for that race in pursuit of victory, of, of winning that race than the last name Bettenhausen, yet that name isn't on right. the Borg Warner Trophy. I almost think it should be there. I don't care where you put it. I know that just the winners go there. I get it. But in my mind, the name Bettenhausen should be there. I don't, even if you want to put it on the bottom, <laughs> scratch it in on the bottom. You can even put an asterisk with it. I don't care. But that name, to me, belongs on that trophy. Oh, you got to earn it. Gotta I, I know. It. But but in my, you got to earn it. But, but who who paid a bigger price than yeah. than your family? I mean, that's that's what I consider earning. Did I know you, you didn't did win. Did you read but, the lap, the back part of the page of the book? My quote. Yeah. It's a perfect time to say this. No, well. I, mean, I mean this with all my heart. And this was done on a radio interview. Radio interview? Yeah. I was sitting in my car, and this quote. I'm going to come back. Here. Okay. I just didn't want to miss anything. <laughs> no. I was afraid I was going to miss something, oh, yeah. some tasty little nugget or something. Because I was. I was basically, uh, uh, Gordon Kirby was interviewing me the first about this. Yeah, the author and, on that book. Yes. Uh, and, and, I, and then I said this, life's not determined by wins. Life's determined by character, the quality of an individual, and the track record you've set for yourself as you lived your life. I can say very positively that we never won Indy, but we had enough quality and character that Bettenhausen and auto racing will be named that will always be remembered and always be loved. Whether you win or not, we've been very successful and racing's been helpful and very successful at making the Bettenhausens what they are today. Uh, I said that... Just off the top of your head. Yes. It's like... Sitting behind the steering wheel of my car. That quote sounds like you sat down and thought about it for four hours and typed out this the words chosen carefully, but that just fell right off your mind. Yeah. And, uh, it almost makes me want to cry when I read it because I think it's a, it was so nice when we wrote that about us. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I mean...